not literal punctures, but sort of analogy is punctures in space-time, very deep distortions in space-time. So black holes, you might have noticed, you know, they actually don't count for much in that inventory. They're really a tiny, tiny, they're so tiny that, you know, you wouldn't see it if I added in the contribution of matter from black holes in that, uh, in that uh, graph. But they do pervade, you know, uh, as we, we are finding out, they are ubiquitous. Black holes seem to be littered everywhere in the universe of all sizes, right? And dark matter, once again, seems to be everywhere, distributed everywhere, smeared like jam everywhere in the universe, but lumped in some places, right? And we don't know its nature. As I said, you know, the part, there have been experiments in particle physics trying to look for this exotic particle. Uh, the only thing that we know about it, it's kind of a bizarre particle. It doesn't interact with anything else. So dark matter does not uh, interact, produce light. It does not emit light. It does not absorb light. It does not reflect light. The only thing it does, it deflects light because all matter deflects light according to Einstein's theory of general relativity. So you have these two entities and I like the contrast between them, which is they're both invisible in the universe. We indirectly infer their presence, as I said, you know, how they manifest. And, but we've mapped them and recently we've made a lot of progress in uh, mapping black holes. So I want to show you that. So the ways in which these two entities were discovered and proposed are fundamentally different. So dark matter was empirically discovered. So, and that was discovered from what the motions, there's excess gravity that is needed to be accounted for to explain the motions of stars in our galaxy, stars in any galaxy. And the question is, where does that gravity come from? And it looks like there is unseen matter that literally holds up the galaxy all the way out beyond where you see the light. The light in galaxies is concentrated in the center. So you've seen images of galaxies um, with stars, really bright stars in the center. The stars peter off. But there appears to be, our current understanding is, there's evidence for the existence of dark matter that appears to be holding everything up. So that was empirical. It's pretty radical, you know. Um, and Vera Rubin, Kent Ford, and her colleagues in the 1970s detected it. They actually sat on the discovery for a few years, didn't publish the papers because, you know, invisible entities uh, historically have a pretty bad rep, right? You had phlogiston, you had ether, you had miasma. So they're like, well, you know, we can't do that. But then the evidence became uh, so incontrovertible because there were so many galaxies, it wasn't, you know, in a small sample. And there was a theory that one could build on dark matter and the gravity of dark matter driving the formation of all structure in the universe. So the, you had this new scaffolding now, right, that could, so there was a theoretical underpinning. Black holes, on the other hand, it turns out, are an exact solution to Einstein's um, field equations that form the basis of the theory of general relativity. He himself never imagined, the equations are complex, a set of 10 equations, that actually, you know, as you all know, the profound thing he did was to combine the uh, geometry, the nature of mass, and gravity. He gave a new description for gravity as an interplay between space, time, and matter, right? So that was what was so radical about what he did. Very different from what Newton did, right? And um, in that theory, he knew it was complex. He thought, you know, he gave these uh, lectures in 1915 at the Prussian Academy of Sciences. And he thought, well, you know, this theory, we don't know about the solutions. Here are the equations that describe uh, describe uh, the way matter moves in space, the way space curves when you have matter, and so on. And it turns out within months, Carl Schwarzschild actually discovered one exact solution, and that is the shape of space around a point mass, a very concentrated lump of matter, and the shape, the distortion in space around that that are caused by that matter. This is sort of the underpinning of Einstein's theory. Einstein actually did not like that solution. And no one thought it corresponded to reality. I mean, it's a mathematical solution, right? I mean, whether it really has salience in the real world, whether there are objects that behave like that was completely unknown at the time. And he did not like that solution, partly because one of the issues with that solution is that it's a solution where the matter is described as having this sort of kind of boundary called an event horizon. And inside the event horizon, it encases singularity, a place where all our understanding of physics break down. We don't have any description for that. 
Okay, so Einstein is like, hmm, that sounds really bizarre. I mean, this can, nature must not permit something like this, right? And so he was a holdout for a long time. But, you know, he was a holdout for, strangely, Einstein, brilliant as he was, right? He did not like the idea of the expanding universe, which his equations actually predicted, right? So, I mean, it took him a while to get convinced. But so here is the idea of a black hole, which is a mathematical solution, unclear if it actually corresponds to reality. So it turns out, of course, it corresponds to reality. We know black holes exist now, black holes of different sizes, different masses, masses and therefore sizes. And so what is a black hole beyond the mathematical solution? Now that we have these physical entities, how do we think about them? So, I mean, sort of broadly, the three ways one can think of, uh, think of them. So in the 1930s, Chandrasekhar showed that uh, the end state of very massive stars, so a star that is born with a birth mass of 10 to 10 times more massive than our sun, will exhaust all its fuel, have an explosion, end its life, and leave a black hole as a corpse. So that's one way. So very concentrated, dense, gravitating material would be the result of a massive st star's death. That would be a black hole. So that's one way to think about a black hole. But you know, I think it's best to think about the black hole as a place. Although as astronomers, we like to think of it as a thing because we are measuring it. As you'll see, these are views that can actually be reconciled quite easily. Complicated, but can be reconciled. So another way to think about black holes is to think of the analogy with the intense gravity. I keep telling you that the gravity is very intense because the matter is so condensed that gravity is very intense. So we look at the Earth and we are launching all these satellites, right? And why do we boost them? We boost them so that they can have a velocity, a speed, that is 11.2 kilometers per second. That's the escape velocity for a rocket to free itself from the grip of Earth's gravity, right? And so if you now just imagine and extrapolate in your head that if you had something, so that's the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and that's the escape velocity. If you think of an object that if you condense all the matter in the Earth, the entire Earth, all of us, into the size of a penny, that would give you the kind of attractive force of gravity, the strength of gravity. From that, the escape velocity would be the speed of light. So that's the basis when people say not even light can escape a black hole. So that's what we mean. The escape velocity from a black hole, from the event horizon of a black hole, is actually the speed of light. Then the final way we want to think about it, and this is what Einstein really taught us, so I was sort of building up, you know, move from more real things to the mathematical description. So one way to think about it, uh, think of black holes, is a sort of punctures, literally sort of punctures not literal punctures, but sort of analogy is punctures in space-time, very deep distortions in space-time. And this is what Einstein um, was able to do with general relativity, as I said, the connecting the shape of space to, to matter and motion. So if there was no matter in the universe, our entire universe can be described by uh, a flat sheet. Okay? And, and when I say flat sheet, it's a sheet not just of space, but space and time sort of commingled together. And now when we do have matter, so for example, you have the sun, it sort of creates a divot in that sheet. Right? So you see that little pothole that's generated whenever you have matter. Now, if you have a neutron star in contrast to the sun, which is much more compact, much more dense, right? So notice it makes a deeper divot in the, in the fabric of space-time. You think of a black hole as really making a puncture, a very sharp a divot in uh, space-time. So, these are the sort of three different ways of thinking about black holes, both mathematical and real. And the question you might say, okay, well, how are they real? So it turns out that every galaxy in our universe pretty much harbors a supermassive black hole. So this is a black hole that is more than a million times the mass of the sun is called supermassive. And so what you saw when we, at the outset of this movie, was real data, it was a real, this is an artist's uh, rendition. Because we haven't quite been able to zoom in, in one frame, go all the way outside to in. We just don't have the technical capacity. Although we have the capacity now to take snapshots, to access with one set of wavelengths just the inner part, and then, you know, other outer parts, so, and then we're able to put that picture together. And so this is an artist's rendition, and what this shows you is that you have this sort of black hole is right at the center where you see that black dot. And what you see swirling there is gas. So it's a gas disk that's the feeding disk for the black hole. So it's all the material that's going to go and get lost and not escape the event horizon of the black hole that you see shown here. 
And the other intriguing thing about black holes, they reveal their presence. So they reveal their presence by what we see happening in the accretion disk. So basically you have a package of gas. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.